So take home your bulletins or look up the first reading at some point later on today. Normally, the last part of that 2 Corinthians reading that Catherine brought to us is read at funeral services. But it's the verse right before the second paragraph where it says, Everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, and so we do not lose heart. That's a subtle theme we're going to hear in the rest of the sermon, which actually turns to the beginning of the gospel, not Paul's writings, but back to the first book of the Bible from the book of Genesis. So this is a story after the creation and after the immediate fall from grace when Adam and Eve are confronted with their sin, by God in the garden. So listen to this reading from Genesis chapter 3. It's verses 8 through 13 and then verses 20 to 21. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. And in verse 20, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife, and God clothed them. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, why is the Garden of Eden story in the Bible itself? Now, some may tell you, well, that story is in the Bible because that's how the world began, that it's a, a factual news report from the beginning of humanity's time on earth which is precisely the wrong answer. The Garden of Eden story is not a documentary. It's a story. It's a foundational myth. It's a parable. It's the answer that comes to a young person's question when he or she is sitting one day by a wise grandparent, or in Espanol, una, una abuela, por ejemplo, and who then asks their grandparent, why is the world the way it is? Why is there beauty as well as pain? Why is there good as well as evil? And so as an answer to that important question, this story is told. This story about Adam and Eve, a story about paradise and about broken trust. And we're told that story even today, not because it's literally true, but because it's essentially true, and it remains true for each of our own lives even today. Now, to shift gears a little bit, recently a reporter asked a group of people, what are you most looking forward to as you prepare to reemerge, hopefully in the coming weeks, from the pandemic and isolation? Now, as you might expect, a lot of the people told the reporter, that they felt excitement over finally seeing people again, finally visiting parents and grandparents, finally holding babies born in the last year, and once more gathering and giving hugs to their loved ones. One woman actually ticked off her own wish list of what she hoped to do in the coming weeks. Going out without a mask, taking in a movie that isn't on my television set, getting together with family and friends, knowing that I will not make someone else ill, and enjoying life once again. So as I thought about what this season means for me and for all of us, it felt a bit like we are back with Adam and Eve 
back into that story, literally stepping out into a world that we're quite aware is no paradise, a place where we have the knowledge of good and evil with us, and where we have to choose what we're going to do as we reemerge once more to walk with God and to walk with one another. So going back to that ancient story, how did Adam and Eve handle that moment? Well, to be honest, they didn't handle it very well. But in truth, they simply did what we've all done on many an occasion. Knowing that they would betrayed God by breaking the promise, the first thing they did was they hid. When they were asked why they were hiding, they said, well, we were ashamed. And when they asked, well, what caused that feeling of shame, they started blaming one another. So fear, shame, denial of responsibility, and blame. For this whole series of events, particularly the last one, I'm going to borrow a baseball analogy. It was basically a triple play of bad behavior. God tossed the ball to Adam, asked why he was disobedient. Adam initially blamed God, but then he tosses the ball to Eve, blaming her as the woman who gave him the fruit. So God asks Eve the same question, and she blames the serpent, throwing the ball full speed at him. Now the serpent, well, he's at a disadvantage. He doesn't have any hands to catch the ball, and so he simply misses it entirely, has nothing to say in his defense. But in that error, at the end, the bases are cleared and the home team has lost the game. Not only for that moment, but for all time. See, the team of Adam and Eve remains the team we play for. It's their uniforms that we wear every day. Now granted, there are some wonderful things that come with being on team Adam and Eve. As a part of humanity, we are... We are capable of amazing acts of creativity, of being a people of hope who dream the best for their children, a people who are capable of sacrificial love. But there's no getting around the fact that as team members, we are deeply flawed. We sin because we're afraid, because we're ashamed, because we don't want to take responsibility. And so we throw the ball away trying to blame someone else, to blame the other political party, to blame the other race or gender or national identity, to blame somehow social media or just pin it all on a string of bad luck. It's like we we take one step forward to engage in the world and end up falling two steps back. Adam and Eve, well, they thought they were making a good career choice by eating the fruit that was forbidden. But by doing so, they broke this fundamental trust that existed between them and God. And so in taking that step forward, they ended falling two steps back, naked, afraid, in a place that really could have been paradise. Now, The problem with thinking that the Garden of Eden story is literally true means that we end up focusing on the characters in the story who look the most like us. We we end up analyzing everything Adam and Eve did, and we watch the replays of the game, and we wonder, well, if they'd only made different choices, maybe things would have turned out better, not only for them, but for all of us. But that's nonsense. From the dawn of time... We have always eaten the fruit. We've always been prone to wrong choices and to sin, to to feelings of fear and shame and blaming. That's just us. That's part of our condition. But that's not why we're told the Genesis story. We're told the Genesis story because of what it tells us about God. In the first chapter of Genesis, God mostly speaks to God's self, announcing, let there be light, or let us make humankind in our own image. In the second chapter of Genesis, God continues to speak, but mostly just makes statements. It is not good that man should be alone, therefore let us make a helpmate, a partner to be with him. 
It is only in this chapter, in chapter 3, that God asks a question, that God invites us into dialogue, into a living, ongoing relationship. There's Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, naked, vulnerable, ashamed. And what does God ask? Where are you? In the cool of the garden, amid the beauty and wonder of this life on earth, God's first question to us is a caring question. Where are you? Imagine for a moment that God is actually asking that question of you as you consider how to reemerge from this pandemic, as you consider how to reengage in a troubled world as you're feeling perhaps exhausted from bouncing off the walls of your own house over these past months, exhausted from trying to keep your kids entertained, dealing with perhaps feelings of depression from being so long socially isolated, from navigating the 24-7 pressures of work, or from battling that anxiety that we're not sure things will ever truly return to normal. But in that moment, take a breath, just as Heather had us do earlier, and think of God's grace. And imagine God's voice calling you by name and simply, caringly asking, where are you? It's an existential question. I mean, God always knew physically where Adam and Eve were in the garden, even when they were hiding in the shadows. This wasn't a game of Eden where's Waldo. God knew where they were, but instead God engages them and asks, where are you? How are you? How are you doing, my beloved children, in whom and with whom I long to be in relationship? And then after God asks that question, we have this batch of comic dialogue, the triple play of fear and shame and blame, and it's followed by a couple verses of God reprimanding the young children and the home team. But the point of the story is what comes after that. Right after that, the woman, the helpmate, rather than receiving any lingering accusation about having taken the forbidden fruit, is instead lovingly named Eve. Eve, the mother of all living, the one in whom we all find our existence and owe our very life. And then in the end, what does God do? Verse 21, the Lord God then made garments of skin for the man and his wife, and God clothed them. Over the last couple of weeks, the conversations I've had over and over again with people have circled around pretty much the same themes. How odd it feels to walk around the world without a mask. How uncomfortable it is the first time that you actually step into someone else's house, or when you share a meal with friends around your own table again, or when you notice the sheer number of people that are now gathering in stores and walking down the sidewalk. As I said, it's been a hard season and continues to be a difficult time for, for elderly, for parents, for those isolated, for those whose nine-to-five job, thanks to email and Zoom, never seems to have an off-duty time. And this time that we find ourselves in contains a lot of unfinished conversations. What does it really mean to re-engage in a world in a post-George Floyd reality where so much around racial reckoning for institutions and individuals still remains to be done? What does it mean to re-engage in a world on the themes of global justice, of caring for this planet, even as we watch cyber attacks cripple industries, as missiles have fallen on the people of Palestine, as wealthy nations have coveted and stockpiled vaccines while many poor nations have yet to even offer them to their people? It's like we're all worried that once again we're going to step out from the garden and take one step forward into the world only to run into problems, obstacles, racism, fighting, infection, virus, and end up find ourselves two feet back, two steps behind where we hope to be. And that's why 
we need the Garden of Eden story. God calls to us, desiring relationship. God speaks to us with our troubled souls and says, where are you? And as we seek to answer that question, we may well take a step back. We may well in that moment fall back on old anxieties and old feelings of shame and fear and low self-esteem. We may even have the tendency in that moment to blame someone else for the difficulties that are very much present in front of us. But God doesn't let us stay there. Even as we take one step back, God takes two steps forward toward us. God seeks us out. Like in all the other wonderful stories and parables in the Bible, the shepherd rescuing the one lost sheep, the, the wise woman who diligently cleans the house till she finds the lost coin, the loving parent who waits and waits for the prodigal child to come back. God calls to us. God seeks us out. And then God clothes us and provides what we need, the right fit, the right garment, the right spirit. Kathleen Norris once said that any relationship to remain alive and vital requires at least two living participants. That's true for us as humans, but it's true for us with God, a living, active God. For us to remember and rely on this God who calls us, who is with us as we reemerge from the shadows, who in Christ redeems us from sin, who with the Holy Spirit shows us the way forward that is just and merciful, and a God who clothes us with what we need. Always. So even when we take one step back, this God, our God, always takes two steps forward toward us. For that, may God be praised. Amen.